The U.S. added three gold medals in basketball and soccer, but one American athlete might have to give her medal back. Plus, we get the latest on these scandals surrounding Brett Favre and a look into esports move into Olympic competitions. It's Monday, August 12th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we'll check in on the latest from Paris. A couple of basketball stars made headlines. Our senior reporter, AJ Perez, provides updates on the scandal involving Brett Favre and misallocated Mississippi welfare dollars in a conversation with our editor-in-chief. And we hear from an executive behind bringing esports into Olympic competitions next year. First, let's hit some headlines. The U.S. women's basketball team capped off an excellent weekend of team sports for the Americans as women's and men's hoops plus women's soccer all took home the gold medal. The basketball programs won their eighth and fifth straight golds respectively, while the soccer team took it for the first time since 2012. American gymnast Jordan Childs has been ordered to return her bronze medal after her floor routine was improperly judged. Although the score was only a tenth of one point off, it was the difference between a bronze for Childs or fifth place, where she ranks now. The U.S. OPC is appealing the decision and said it will, quote, continue to work diligently to resolve this matter swiftly and fairly. Iman Khalif won the gold medal in women's boxing on Friday. Over the weekend, she filed a legal complaint with the Paris prosecutor's office for the online abuse that she endured throughout the Olympics over false claims about her gender. Khalif's attorney cited acts of aggravated cyber harassment and misogynistic, racist, and sexist campaigns. A man was arrested on Sunday after he was seen free climbing the Eiffel Tower prior to the Olympic closing ceremonies, and the area was evacuated temporarily. The man made it about halfway up before he was cut off by police and removed from the tower. 30,000 police officers have been deployed for the closing ceremonies. IOC President Thomas Bach is not looking for a third term when elections take place next year. New times are calling for new leaders, he said, adding that it is in the best interest of our beloved Olympic movement. It's not immediately clear who will take over for Bach, but the sitting president has been in this position for the past 11 years. When he was elected, Bach established a new Olympic mindset, change or be changed. He seems to be applying the same ethos to his own career. Up next, my colleague AJ Perez has been tracking the scandal that could implicate Hall of Famer Brett Favre in which millions of dollars intended for Mississippi's poorest residents instead went to projects connected to the quarterback. He spoke with Front Office Sports Editor-in-Chief Dan Roberts about the latest developments in that case, and that conversation is next. Okay, Dan Roberts here in the front office sports studio in New York, and our senior reporter AJ is visiting from D.C. AJ, what's up? Oh, not much. So let's get the very latest on a story that you have been all over, and you've been quoted in a lot of press about this. We've had other newspapers want to syndicate your work. You have been covering very closely this Brett Favre Mississippi welfare scandal. I think it's certainly fair to call it mm-hmm. a scandal. And most recently, we've seen that one of his business partners was charged in the case. Let's put that aside for a sec. Let's actually go all the way back to the beginning, 2020 or so, Mm -hmm. and let's fill anyone in if somehow, miraculously, they have missed this whole Brett Favre news cycle. What's going on with this welfare scandal? This really goes back to February 2020 when the first people were charged as part of the scandal. Now we're talking 90 plus million dollars of misspent federal welfare funds. Um, And uh, it's, there was the, the, the indictment there in February 2020. Three months, two or three months later, we, we, we find that Favre was uh, attached to this because he got $1.1 million for speeches, PSAs, um, and uh, for this is not money, this is banned use of the funds. Um, and that his, his name has been attached since April 2020 all the way through this. He's now, he hasn't been charged criminally. He is a defendant in a lawsuit from the welfare department trying to recoup this money. Now, of course, my mind goes first to other examples where celebrities or athletes endorsed a product or had some type of involvement with an organization, but very often when that company or product or brand gets in trouble, well, I was just a paid endorser, you know, they're able to say I wasn't involved in the business Mm -hmm. dealings. Does that apply here or is there some reason maybe that Favre might be more liable because of his involvement? Yeah, there's a couple of different parts of it. It, He was an endorser for part of it, Uh, the the drug company, this company called Prevacus was developing a concussion tr- treatment. You know, he was an endorser of that product and he was also the largest investor according to court documents. Uh, but also we're talking, we're talking about $8 million of funds attached to Favre. He had $1.1 million for the speeches, which he's repaid. The principal, he, he, the principal's been repaid. The state auditor, Shad White's trying to recoup the money for, for interest around $700,000. The other part of it is $5 million that went to um, the uh, USM um, uh, Athletic Foundation. So to, to build a volleyball center at, at Southern Miss, where his daughter was, you know, she, she committed to play there. And uh, right when she committed, right within a few weeks, he started looking into building a brand new volleyball arena there. 
also $5 million of TANF funds. Um, and the, the last part was about $2 million to Prevacus, the, that drug company. Um, so really, it's all, he's still not been criminally charged. He's denied any wrongdoing. Um, and he's obviously fought a lot of, uh, a lot of battles in this, including suing uh, Shannon Sharp, sh suing, right. suing, uh, suing Pat McAfee, suing the state auditor, Shad White. Um, and uh, uh, McAfee settled without just kind of an apology. That went away. Um, uh, Sharp's case was originally thrown out of court last year. He's uh, far has appealed that decision, um, and uh, the Shad White defamation lawsuit is still ongoing. Wow. Now, of course, you know when you go through this song and dance of whack-a-mole with trying to sue everyone who's talked about the case in a certain way, at some point it gets big enough that you know that uh, it's almost like the, the lady doth protest too much. You can't sue everyone who talks about it. Um, but what else has Favre said? You know, we we know that in the courtroom he said you know he was denied any wrongdoing. But how much publicly has he talked about? these claims and his role in all of this and, and this unfortunate uh, development. That's a, that's a hard part for him. He's under a suppression order like all the other defendants in this case. So he he has gone on a pod, podcast with Jason Whitlock. He's a regular, you know, up until a couple months ago, he was very, he was on there pretty frequently. Um, and, uh, you know, and through other means, he said the truth will come out. He said in, in, in other videos and just kind of he'll be vindicated with basically what he's saying. Um, and, uh, you know, there's only a couple months left to charge him criminally for uh, by f the federal prosecutors because the five years actually limitations. We, uh, in one of my recent stories, if we kind of traced it back to October 2019, you had five years, that's only a couple months away. Mm. And now we can get to the latest news, which was kind of the last or the, the last remaining person other than Favre who had not been charged was indicted um, what was that person's role, and, and what does that mean, if anything, for the likelihood that Favre will or won't get charged and all Yeah, that? in January 2nd of uh, 2019, there was a meeting at Favre's house. There were six people there, um, with Jake Van Lattingham being charged. This is like, that was the biggest news we've had in many, many months, because there's been people at, at the top of the chain, like John Davis, who is the, who, who was the former head of the uh, Mississippi um, Welfare Department, and then you had Nancy New and Zach New, where the money was funneled to through far, to Favre and many others. Um, they've all been charged, first state charges and then federal charges. So now there's of, of those people at that meeting, um, after Jake, Jake got charged uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, Favre is the only person at that meeting that, who has not faced wow. a federal indictment. Um, so that's, so we're just kind of, we're seeing in the next, next few weeks, um, less than two months, you know, we'll probably know whether whether Farber will be charged for anything he did in relation to the to this whole fund scandal. Let's talk about the attempt to recoup the funds. You said there's another seven hundred thousand, and uh, that's what the auditor Shad White wants to get back. Brett Favre made a lot of money playing football. Mm -hmm. Could he functionally end this by just paying that amount instead of continuing to you know resist? I mean, is that seen as that would be some type of admission of guilt? I mean, could he? give back every single last dollar that he had coming to him in, in all this. Yeah, Brett Favre made about $140 million during his NFL, NFL career. Now, granted, that's like gross number. You got to pay your agent, you got to pay taxes. That's so, but it's probably closer to $90 million, a lot of money. And there's no indications that he's like wildly misspent money and had bad business dealings and, you know, like a lot of athletes who, who, who kind of get in trouble after they retire. But he's also was one of the top endorsers in my lifetime, post-career. There's been very few people like Favre you remember the Wrangler, yep. you remember, you know, Copperfit, and a lot of our early reporting was on why are these brands sticking with him? And eventually, by the end of uh, 2022, they all abandoned him, hmm. uh, put him on pause. So, you know, this, he could make that lawsuit go away from, from Shad White, but he's, but he's fighting it. You know, there's also some little inside legal things, whether if Shad White has the authority to go after the money the way he's doing it in court. And he, so that's a whole kind of another part of it. If he would have, and I talk, every, you know, it, when, I, when I talk to my sources and people down in Mississippi, if Favre in April 2020 would have apologized, you know, and paid it up front instead of dragging it out months, he, it, took him, it took him many, many months to pay it back in two different payments. If he would have like got in front of this and either, you know, and, you know, and just kind of took responsibility. And really, if, if his party line is like, he didn't know this is welfare funds. He didn't know, he, he didn't know exactly where the money was coming from. It's coming from the state. He likely knew that. Um, in court filings, we found out that, you know, the state, the, you know, the state welfare department, you know, thinks at, at a certain point he knew that it was welfare funds. So, but if you would want, if you're going back in time, if he just chose to, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of a big, a, 
mea culpa and got ahead of this. And I'm not saying he had to pay back all the money because because the money, the only money that went to him was that first one point one million dollars. The other went to USM and and to uh, and to the drug company. You know, he could have got away with it. This would be all over. We wouldn't he wouldn't be he would be he probably wouldn't have lost many or any endorsements. He wouldn't have had all these legal costs. He probably he's probably racking up. Um, and he wouldn't have been vilified, you know, on social media because every time we post one of our stories, you see the comments, and people are wondering why, you know, why he's done this. And mm -hmm. it's just kind of that's a question we really don't know the real answer to. There's also obviously a pattern that we saw through this whole thing, um, but it's kind of like you have to prove um, you have to prove intent, and that's the hardest part of this. Well, and again, he says no wrongdoing, which is which is important. He hasn't been charged. It's all really important to mention. What are the chances that he was just? either poorly advised or very often these guys have handlers, whether it's a comms person, an agent, who links them up with someone. Sure, he was at a meeting. Now, the fact that it was at his, at his house, maybe he was more involved than, than usual, but um, has he attempted any sort of argument along that line of, you know, I, I merely was brought in and, and wasn't involved with the money part of this, didn't know where things were coming from? He's kind of said things close to that. But when you see the text messages, like one of the one of the bigger ones we saw a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, he asked Nancy New, who was the, who was the head of that nonprofit, you know, will the media find out? Can the media find out? And then you got other texts to John, you know, talking with Jake Van, Jake Van Landingham, um, you know, you know, talking about buying John Davis, the head of the department, uh, yeah, a Ford Raptor, which those are like a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, that does not look good for him. So, but so these. You know, he, 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 he can say what he said, but you look back at the text. Now you can't read everything into him because we don't have any of the text from Barr's cell phone. All these texts are coming in from other people's cell phone that have got caught up in this case. So we really don't, we, there, there, there could be more or that could mm -hmm. be all of it. That's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's a, since the federal investigation is still going on, we don't really know. Wow, text messages are always such a treasure trove in these cases. Uh, let's go back real quick to USM and that volleyball facility. Did that get built? And what has the school said about this whole thing? Yeah, I went to a game there. Uh, it was, it's been open, been open about three or four years now, um, and uh, it's it, it looks like a church. It's like uh, it looks like uh, looks like you know, and they and they call it the wellness center. So they it looks like they were trying to you know, this is from it's, this is money going to the poorest people in the poorest state, and ninety five percent or more of people who apply for this money, you know, who make four or five hundred dollars a month with a family of one or two you know kids, can't get to it. Yet it went to this volleyball arena called the Wellness Center at right on campus, and uh, I went there. You know, I there's they weren't they weren't handing out you know free food to anybody. They were. It's not called the Far Volleyball Center. No, it's not called. It's just called the Wellness Center. Okay. So they so there was there that that that's always stood out to me because I was like, why do they have to call it that? If it was just if 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 this was just you know a volleyball arena that Far helped fundraise for. You know, you know, that's great. And Farb did uh, his charity gave about um, a little over a hundred thousand dollars to the to the effort as well. Okay. Um, so you know, so through his charity. So there is a you know there he was he, he there was a handshake agreement at the time. From that point on, you could see him through the text messages trying to get you know money and it ended up coming from federal TANF funds. Mm -hmm. And Prevacus, which is a, a pretty big drug company, is this whole thing a blip for them? This is an existential crisis. What has uh, this pharma company said about all this? It's one thing I was like going, looking back. They got um, they got several payments during 2019, totaling a little over two million dollars. By early 2020, the company was pretty much dead. Um, this the the IP was acquired by one company called Odyssey. Then it was acquired by another company. There have been some trials for that. Um, for but really we're you know, it costs so many millions of dollars to get to, to human trials and to the, get FDA approval. That's nowhere close. And it was also a novel concept, which is like you, 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 you take a hit to the head on the sideline or, you know, on the bench, you, you inhale this, this kind of, this anti-inflammatory and supposed to reduce, you know, uh, you know, the, at, the impacts of, or the effects of a concussion. And there's, Sounds like smelling salts a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, there was, so there's really, that's really hard to, you know, that's kind of like, Inflammation is one part of having concussion. There's many other factors. Yeah. Um, so there's really been no like major studies that show that it, this this approach works. And they've been working on this. Jake Van Anaheim is working on this for just a decade now. And uh, and it's really it really didn't that didn't go anywhere. Hmm. Uh, AJ, let's end this way for for readers and viewers who feel pretty caught up now. You've said there's about two months left to see if Favre gets charged in all this or doesn't. Uh, what else is left to happen? 
What's the rest of this story moving forward? What more could occur in this kind of long saga that you've been all over? Yeah, it's like we're gonna uh, we're gonna see over the next couple months what happens. But yeah, there's really this has been going on for a while. Everybody who's been charged, you know, there's always been two big fish in this entire thing. Two big fish would be Phil Bryant, which is a former governor who was at the top of this. But he was uh, Phil Bryant was the one who actually tipped off the auditor. He's a former state auditor himself. He uh, tipped off Shad White. Hey, you look into this. There's some weird spending going on. Um, the use of this 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 charity that Nancy knew. I'm oh, sorry, this nonprofit that, that Nancy knew had. Uh, you know, there was like, where do you going on? So like Phil Bryant, you know, there are a lot of the reporting from Mississippi has been kind of focused on him. I focused on Favre, I'm a sports writer. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it, this, th this has tarnished, you know, his, his legacy at this point. And, you know, whether, whether he gets charged or not, he's, people are going to remember him for this. You know, and uh, we'll, well, in 10 more years from now, we'll be, we'll be remembering him as the gunslinger with the, you know, with the, with the Green Bay Packers, with the Vikings, and I guess with the Jets, if you can count that. Uh, you know, the, are we going to remember him for that, or are we going to remember him for, for this concussion, oh, sorry, for this, uh, for the scandal? And it's so weird. It's, you know, that's why we're kind of in, in a whole holding pattern on that. Um, you know, he could come out of it, and he could, you know, a lot, of, a lot of players, former players, you know, get in trouble and then get out of it, and we forget. So we'll see. This is, of course, why athletes uh, take it so seriously and get so litigious sometimes with uh, trying to sue big broadcasters and talking heads that, that talk about it. Uh, great stuff, AJ. Keep up the great reporting. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. The Paris Games marked the debut of breakdancing as an Olympic sport, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. In 2025, a new type of competition will begin under the IOC banner. The Olympic eSports Games will start next year in Saudi Arabia, which will be its home until at least 2037. I spoke with Eric Poulier, one of the executives leading the charge on bringing esports onto the international stage, on what this means for esports and why they are worthy of being considered alongside the more traditional Olympic sports as a peak form of competition. That conversation is next. I am joined now by Eric Poulier, CEO of Vadim, and as of this month, the uh, chair of the Digital Transformation Commission at the Global Esports Federation. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to have you on. So the inaugural esports games are happening next year in Saudi Arabia. The the Olympic uh, inaugural Olympic esports games. Uh, what does this mean for the world of esports? I think it's an absolutely monumental moment. There's no more respected institution in sports than the Olympics, and for the IOC to come forward and plainly state that this is now part of the Olympic Games moving forward will give um, a new, I would say, focus for people all over the world who want to become Olympians to look at what types of sports are going to emerge here and to train, challenge themselves, compete, and become Olympians in an entirely new format. Yeah, and you know, this opens up an entire world of potential competitions. What sorts of, of games are, are going to be included here? So I won't speak for the IOC in terms of the games that they'll ultimately choose, but I think that it's safe to say two things. One is that the world of esports, as it currently exists, has evolved for certain games to emerge as being the primary games that people compete with. And uh, those games will certainly be the contenders along with uh, maybe variations on those uh, for certain reasons related to branding or related to specific elements of how they intend to score them. But, uh, but that, that's just one component. The second component, equally important and really has not been well understood to date, has to be the virtual sports. So when we talk about esports today, you think about the sports where you're uh, competing with the handheld controllers, uh, on high-end PCs or, or, or consoles. When you think about the sports uh, that are coming, that fall under the category of virtual sports, we're talking about sports that more mirror existing sports in the sense of um, moving your body, in the sense of competing in a way that your physicality is fully immersed. Uh, we're talking about sensors. We're talking about AI visualization. Uh, how this relates to virtual Taekwondo, virtual boxing, virtual fencing, virtual weightlifting, uh, the sports uh, such as squash and tennis and other sports where you can readily see how incredible it will be to evolve these new technologies. I think a lot of people around the world will use these as starter 
initiatives to learn various sports and go across them and then choose the ones they want that ultimately will lead them into the traditional physical sports and others will stay within the virtual realm and compete there and uh, have a whole new world open to them. I'm sure you get this question all the time, uh, but I, I think a lot of our audience, you know, has been watching for the last couple of weeks, the fastest runners in the world, the best swimmers in the world, the best fencers in the world, um, and thinking, you know, this, this is a simulation. This is a video game. This is a categorically different thing uh, from the Olympics. How do you respond to those folks? I respond that uh, it is a different thing, uh, as is skiing to weightlifting, as is weightlifting to um, running and tennis. They are different sports, but they also have certain commonality. They involve um, training to an absolute level. Some would say almost a superhuman level or the highest level of human achievement in your physicality and your mind and body. Uh, they involve sometimes collaboration, team sports. Uh, that one can play together around strategies and uh, and the intuitive nature of how one becomes uh, one with your teammates and can actually compete as one in the in these forms. Uh, so these elements are the same. The other elements that are quite interesting are when you think about traditional sports. There's a reason why there aren't many, and I'll I'll say uh, any if, without fear of reproach. People in their 80s and 90s, perhaps uh, competing in uh, some of the more uh, physical sports or any sports where your reaction times tend to slow as you age, et cetera. Well, it's similar in, in esports. It's no surprise that as you get older, you're also, your reaction times change. You're the, the, the speed with which you can think and react changes. And so as you train for those to become the optimal athlete you can be, you can very see that, you can very well see that these relate to um, the same types of um, I would say athleticism that you need in traditional sports. Now, even more so when you move to what we call virtual sports, you are physically moving your body. And when you're physically moving your body, you are really in a completely um, maybe new sport, but a very similar and familiar uh, competitive mindset. So, so imagine that you're competing in virtual Taekwondo. And today you're living in a country where Taekwondo masters are few and far between. And maybe you're living in a place that might be even expensive to travel somewhere where you can train uh, and compete. Now imagine uh, a step further where the virtual sports for let's say Taekwondo emerge and there's a clear track of training all the way to uh, leagues within local communities, all the way to national, all the way to something like uh, the Olympic Games uh, themselves. And you now have the ability uh, at extremely low cost, uh, as you can see this technology evolving, to train with the greatest Taekwondo champion who ever lived and to interact with that AI and to be given precise instructions around your movements and how they relate to what would be optimal and the training regimen and the, and the, the, the diet regimens, et cetera. And then, and then being able to compete virtually with other people around the world uh, or in local communities, you may decide to evolve for whatever reason to uh, the traditional physical path in Taekwondo or something else, uh, or you may stay within that realm and uh, advance yourself. But uh, on the basis of inclusion, it's, uh, it's a revolution. And on the basis of what it means to be an athlete, again, you will have no less physical challenges and mental challenges than you do in the traditional sports as these evolve. But the opportunities for new forms of competition and who can engage in that competition will be expansive. You mentioned, you know, how, oh, this at the highest level, um, it's hard for people to compete as, you know, as they age, their reaction time slows down. Um, I, I read this article years ago. I, yeah, at this point, couldn't tell you what publication or the team they were talking about. But the detail that stuck with me was that they're talking about this, this esports team and they, there's a four member team and they had a coach who had aged out of his reaction time was too slow to, um, but he was, you know, still knew the game was, you know, was, yeah 
you know, he was the coach. Um, and the coach was 26. <laughs> and at 26, <laughs> his thumbs or whatever, his fingers were too slow. Um, is that man. the sort of um, age range we're talking about where it's like kind of a 25 and under sort of set who are competing at the highest level? Well, yes and no. I mean, in general, we're talking about a very similar phenomenon that you see in other sports. You will find a Tom Brady that will come forward and prove everybody wrong about what the age range can and should be. But in general, yes, you'll find that people at the height of their physical and mental sharpness and prowess will be the most successful competitors. And there will be a natural bell curve in that uh, tapering off as one ages. But with proper conditioning and practice and mental toughness and all the rest that goes into being a great athlete, you'll find that extended. And then you also find outliers who come in at any age, which gives us hope for all of us. You're also the CEO of Vatom, which is a metaverse company. Um, do you see, you know, esports? I mean, for all I know, they, they may already move in this direction, but um, are, are, or do you see things kind of moving into these, this virtual world direction? So let's just talk about the word metaverse for a moment. Um, the way that we see this concept is a meta plane of reality on top of the existing reality. It's really a, a social ownership and, and, and uh, in some ways, a competitive uh, arena that can be put into the real world in the form of these virtual sports with sensors and, and otherwise, but also um, broadcast and portrayed into virtual spaces. So if you're a fan, let's say, you may want to show up in a traditional linear space and turn on the TV and watch two virtual athletes competing. They may show up uh, as themselves and actions, uh, or they also may show up as their avatar counterparts, fighting, wrestling, fencing, boxing, uh, and what have you. You can now imagine as you move into virtual spaces as a, as a fan, you're not just standing apart from the action and watching from the couch, as it were. You can step right into it and, and, and all around it and, and through it because the 3D um, environments are not being projected to you on 2D. They're, they're surrounding you and you're entering that. That's a more immersive and quite interesting way to uh, interact, socialize with others and be part of the sport. You know, when, when you watch the traditional Olympics, it's very easy to understand, you know, track and field. It's like, who's running the fastest? Who's, who's swimming the fastest? Even there are some sports that are a little harder to follow. Um, but, and obviously some sports have kind of a viewer learning curve. I'm wondering, um, when it comes to esports, how easy is it for someone who's maybe curious, but who doesn't play, um, and, and, you know, is not especially, you know, oh, doesn't quite know the games that they're even tuning into. How easy is it for them to pick it up and start enjoying? Well, I think it'll be far easier. I mean, if you think about how one actually enjoys uh, sports today, it's it's very much the digital overlay and the commentary that helps you understand what's what, unless you're a true expert. I mean, if you're watching swimming or, or uh, basketball and you're not deeply involved in the sport, you want that overlay of saying, here's who this person is. There's what they're doing here. Uh, people telling you what's going on. It's, it's very similar in esports where you might have eSIM racing and you know, somebody is saying who's in, who's controlling what car and what move did they just make and why was that strategic and what does that mean and who's coming from behind and for, and what are their odds of now and, uh, you know, achieving a certain level of, um, of, of success in the race and, uh, and on and on. Um, when you're talking about fencing, the moves that you'll see, if you're not deeply skilled in fencing, you're not going to understand what one move is or another and so maybe even why points are awarded. But the digital overlays and the commentary around it will become, I think, even better, not only for virtual sports, uh, in virtual sports, but I think a lot of what's going to be understood and developed for esports and virtual sports will then come back to traditional sports to help you enjoy those in a more engrossing way as well. Very interesting stuff. Eric Poulier, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me today. When Angel Reese signed with Reebok, she made a promise she'd bring the Bach back. Now, in just under two weeks, Angel Reese's first apparel line will be hitting shelves. Reese will release three shoes and accompanying outfit options, including graphic tees, track jackets, and full-body suits. She has coined a phrase that will be featured on her merch, 
When they sleep on you, tuck them in. With the collection, Reese said she wanted to allow women and girls everywhere to embrace their femininity and power in whatever they're doing. This collection is for her to be stylish and fierce on all occasions. Reese's celebrity has certainly extended beyond the court, although she has also been a formidable force on the hardwood in her rookie year. On her growing off-court brand, Reese said, it's about showing I'm not just a basketball player. The rappers, the singers, everyone knows who I am. Jason Tatum has been humbled this summer. After winning his first NBA championship, Tatum has been mostly buried in the Team USA rotation, which head coach Steve Kerr has called a math problem with so many other talented players on the roster. Tatum played just 11 minutes in the USA's gold medal victory on Saturday after not making it off the bench in the semifinal win versus Serbia. Fellow Celtics Derek White and Drew Holiday have been more consistent parts of the rotation than their all-NBA teammate. As social media has piled on Tatum for his low playing time, reporters asked the 26-year-old if he planned to return to the program in 2028. Tatum said, It was a tough personal experience on the court, but I'm not going to make any decisions off emotions. I would have to take time and think about that. Maybe Tatum and Jalen Brown should start their own Olympic team instead. That's it for today. Let us know what you think about the show. You can find us on social media at Front Office Sports, and this show has its own X account at FOS underscore today. You can also find me at Owen Poindexter. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.